Thank you everyone for joining us for the Future Frio Forum. And you'll see a rolling presentation as I make my opening remarks to you that gives you a bit of a background about the Future Frio project. And I'm Marion Fulker. I'm the CEO of the Committee for Perth and also project manager of this Future Frio project. Welcome to the Mayor of the City of Fremantle, uh, his fellow councillors and staff, uh, and also to those from uh, the town of East Fremantle. Um, Graham Gammy, my executive director from the State Heritage Office, was supposed to be here. He'll be getting a black mark in his book. Um, the Future Frio project has a steering committee of a number of funding partners, and so they're acknowledged in the slide, uh, and a number of them are present today. So thank you very much for coming. Our special guest, Chuck Wolf, and I'll have more to say about Chuck shortly. Um, but Chuck is actually here on holidays and uh, has given up his time. And it goes to show that the network of Committee for Perth friends extends far and wide. I've never met Chuck before in my life, but uh, he is a good friend of a friend of the Committee for Perth, Lyle Bicknell, who uh, is the city planner at the City of Seattle. And I met with him a couple of years ago when he visited Perth last year. So the good and the great of Fremantle, thank you very much for turning up. Um, I'm really pleased with the spread of ages and gender. As you would have known, the most recent major report that the Committee for Perth has done is on gender equality, and so we are totally attuned to this issue of making sure that there's diversity of thought uh, as whenever we're sort of presenting information. So the objectives of tonight are to share with you the aims of the Future Freo project, which started at a sort of strange time. It arose out of the Frio 2029 workshops uh, where the City of Fremantle was putting together a strategy document and consulting with the community. And there was a sense of, should there be a committee for Fremantle set up? And the Committee for Perth View, who operates across the whole Perth and Peel region, was that actually wouldn't be very useful to us and it certainly wouldn't be very useful to you. So we decided to bring our intellect and wisdom and the way that we do things, which is quite unusual. Uh, we don't actually start with an endpoint in mind. We go on a journey with the community. So that's sort of somewhat different to the way most things are done. And uh, once the city came on board as the underpinning funder for the Future Frio project, uh, the town of East Fremantle joined the Chamber of Commerce and in a number of commercial interests, including the port. So we've been meeting uh, since we launched on the 17th of September, I think it was last year. The steering committee's been meeting regularly, looking at what the research is telling us. And that's what we're planning to share with you tonight. So you're going to hear from Pro Professor Matthew Tonce. He's the convener of our fact-based project, which is a strategic research alliance with the University of Western Australia. And uh, Matthew's job with his team is to uncover the facts and figures about Greater Perth and in this instance bringing no, those insights into what's happening in Greater Fremantle. You're also going to hear from me where I've looked at, um, had a researcher look at the perception survey of the residents of the city of Fremantle and the town of East Fremantle and I'm going to give you what the evidence suggests compared to what the perceptions are. Then we're going to ask the Mayor to reflect on some of the opportunities and challenges for Fremantle and what he's learnt out of his recent study tour that he thinks might be applicable to Fremantle. And then we're going to hear from Chuck, who's an attorney at law from Seattle, who has produced a book called Urbanism Without Effort, which I thought would be particularly useful to the Fremantle community as you think about how you grow and develop over the years. Chuck arrived two and a bit weeks ago with his gorgeous fiancée Fiona and they drove to Broome and they drove back from Broome and they arrived last night. <laughs> so I have been stalking him on Facebook to the point where this morning I go, Chuck, are you back in Perth? Are you safe and sound? And I get the, yeah, yeah, we arrived in Fremantle last night. We're fine. So as in with most of our international visitors, Chuck will stick to the rules of he's not a wise man from elsewhere that has, is going to ram stuff down Fremantle's throat. He's more going to reflect on his work and make some you know, little comments along the way about how they might be applicable to Fremantle. So to formally welcome you on behalf of the University of Notre Dame, can I please ask Julian to come up and uh, say a few words? Thanks very much, Marion. Uh, my name's Julian Smith. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor of Strategy and Planning here at the University. And I this afternoon have the, the um, I guess, privilege of, of welcoming, welcoming you to the University on behalf of our Vice Chancellor, Professor Celia Hammond, and to welcome you again also to the fu um, Future Frio Public Forum. For 25 years, our students and our staff have had the 
privilege of coming to work and study each day in the place that is, that is um, Fremantle, a, a diverse and a vibrant place. Um, and in that time, I guess, as the world around us, Fremantle has gone through some change, but it's remained distinctly Frio. Um, and as a university, we're, we're proud of that Frio community. We're also proud to be a part of that community. And so we're, we're really delighted to be a part of um, uh, the uh, Future Frio project and to have the opportunity to see that glimpse into the future and see what opportunities um, that may lay ahead. And so really looking forward to your presentation this afternoon, Chuck. A couple of housekeeping matters. Toilets are just outside to your left, just out there. Um, just ask you to turn your mobile phones off. We are recording this afternoon. And in the event of emergency, don't assume the brace position. However, do make your way out of the exits and uh, the, the muster point is down on um, the Esplanade Park there. Um, so today we're meeting on uh, Wajak Wudja land and I'd like to introduce Professor Len Collard to give his welcome to country. No, I understand Len's not here yet, so hopefully he will come soon. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I'll hand that to you, mate. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Julian, and Notre Dame have been an incredibly generous partner in the uh, steering committee process, so uh, Celia has hosted all of the meetings that we've had uh, and generously worked with the city for this public forum. So we're particularly pleased, and thank you, and please convey our thanks to Celia. Um, now, I think what we might do is just get into the presentations in the hope that Len comes. We always like to have an acknowledgement of country and a welcome to country, if at all possible. We're very strongly aligned to reconciliation. And, um, not here? No, okay, all right. Well, Matthew, if you don't mind, we will get on with your presentation. So Matthew and his team of economic geographers at the University of Western Australia have looked into various elements of Fremantle and benchmark them against metropolitan Perth. And I hope that you find some of these insights quite um, enriching in some ways and probably sobering in others. So what I've done today is uh, pulled together some material that we've uh, presented already uh, through a series of bulletins uh, over, over the better part of the year. And all I've done is really pick out, I think, a few sort of interesting um, Interesting elements of Fremantle's development, uh, covering off aspects of its demography, its economic structure, uh, where it's sort of positioned in the world and maybe how it's changing. And the objective is not really to um, is not really try and paint the future just yet, but to really just understand how the place is evolving, um, what is it all, how is it sort of organised at present and what might be some of the issues that emerge just from data at this stage. All I've done is really been quite selective in terms of the material that we've already put out there in these bulletins. They're all available on the Committee for Perth website. And this is all leading towards a more significant report that will be launched on the 1st of December. So there's material that I'll cover that is already out there and um, perhaps during the panel sessions and so on there'll be things that, uh, that we're working on at present that you might want to know a little bit more about. Um, we'll see where the discussion takes us. So today I'll just cover off four sort of themes that struck me as being important in terms of establishing the baseline for Fremantle a little bit, understanding where it's positioned locally, but also how it fits into the wider world. And so I've covered off a few simple things around its population demographics, a little bit about what are the characteristics of the people who live here and, 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 uh, and maybe work elsewhere or happen to work here. So what does the working population look like? I was particularly interested to look at socioeconomic performance. Um, and the socioeconomic performance is really trying to understand issues like social inequality, uh, social equality, um, and really how is the place performing relative to other areas in terms of the overall wellbeing of, of the local population. And lastly, uh, we'll look a little bit about, uh, at a little bit about uh, how the, the city is positioned relative to the rest of the world. I'm not alone in this venture. I've got some colleagues who've done a lot of work behind the scenes. I just happen to be talking about this. So my colleagues, Veronica Huddleston, Kirsten Martinus and Paul McGinn have also done an awful lot of work on this. So I'd acknowledge their, their contributions. Just to be clear about what, how we've looked at Fremantle, we've really um, uh, taken, I suppose, a fairly instrumentalist kind of view of the city. You know, there are different ways you could define it, but we've covered off uh, really using the um, uh, the, the administrative boundaries that the ABS defined for, for Fremantle. It's convenient, it's good for data availability and so on. 
It's questionable in some respects whether those data are always organised in a way that, that uh, match, I suppose, your mental map of Fremantle, um, but it's what we have to work with. So what we've done is sort of disaggregated data around those particular areas. So just as a starting point, and this is not going to be surprising, I think, probably to anybody really in the room, is that Fremantle's population has not been one of, of rampant growth over the past 10 years or so. And you could look at that, I think, in a number of different ways. You could say that, in some respects, it was protected from the excesses of the boom. Um, other, another way of looking at that would be to say, maybe there are elements of the boom that weren't capitalised upon. I guess that also depends a little bit on whether you regard population growth and population performance as a measure of success or not. I mean, I think that's, that's open to debate. But by and large, um, we've seen growth rates that are pretty steady in Fremantle. You can see there they range sort of from six and a bit percent back through to some decline in the in the old core area of Fremantle, ranging sort of around that four percent. As a comparator, the Perth metropolitan area over the decade 2001 to 2011 grew at just under 20 percent. Now, that's not really a fair comparison necessarily because Fremantle obviously doesn't have the opportunity to expand into greenfield sites um, and to uh, to expand in a way that is comparable with the wider Perth metropolitan area. It's obviously much more constrained. But as I said, a key question here is, is population growth your measure of success or not? And, and I think that's, that's open for, for question. What is rather interesting, I think, about Freeman, and I, hopefully these are clear from the back, is it's a very stable population. So about half of the population in 2011, for, for a, a example, didn't change locations uh, from their 2006 address. And similarly, between 2001 and 2006, about half the population stayed where they were. But of course, what that means is that about half the population are in new locations, okay? So they're, in new ad they're at new addresses. Now, what that means, I think, for Fremantle is that people are constantly making choices about where they live. And there'll be all sorts of decisions that run through those people's minds about livability, about economic opportunities, about housing and so on that are important in influencing those decisions. But by and large the dynamics are not that different from <coughs> the wider Perth metropolitan area where about half the population move. What is rather interesting is that about 85% of the people who've moved into Fremantle come from other parts of Western Australia. But there is a steady little flow from Victoria and New South Wales and to some degree uh, Queensland South Australia. So it's not exclusively a Western pop uh, population. People who are coming from other parts of the country do tend to touch uh, uh, do tend to touch the ground first in Fremantle. So there is something important that's going uh, on there. Another aspect of the Fremantle population, which is rather intriguing, what I didn't put up here is the comparison with the wider metropolitan area, but I can talk a little bit about that is that by and large we have a gently, <coughs> steadily ageing population. It's not, it's not a rapidly ageing population, but it's certainly one that is, that is um, moving towards uh, old age fairly really, steadily and gracefully perhaps. Um, the difference is perhaps the older core areas of Fremantle, which are sort of all over the place. Now they're fairly small numbers in here as well. And you can see the old you know, core of Fremantle has these two parts of the population that are particularly um, apparent. And that is a group between the ages of about 20 and about 30, 35, and then another group in their 50s and 60s. It's quite different from the other, uh, the other parts of Fremantle. Um, it's also changed considerably over time, um, over time as well. So something is, is happening that's quite distinctive in the core area of Fremantle. The other areas, by and large, tend to be heading in the, in the same direction, perhaps with the exception of East Fremantle. How is any of this relevant, you might ask? I think that the interesting thing about age gender profiles is they tell us a lot about future service uh, delivery requirements. They tell us a lot about the socio-cultural changes that might be experienced in a particular area. And perhaps what they do is raise as many questions as they do answer, uh, answer questions. But an important part of the changes that are, that are affecting um, the Fremantle area. These were data that surprised me. So, this is now turning to the population who uh, live in Fremantle and may work in Fremantle or may work elsewhere. This is basically the working population. And one of the things that struck me about this was how vulnerable Fremantle seemed to be compared to the rest of the metropolitan area to the 2008-09 global financial crisis. 
You can see there, it, this, this big dip here is the local areas in Fremantle all taking a hit in terms of job creation, job generation, around about the global financial crisis. While well, the Perth metropolitan area, by and large, got through, not quite unscathed, but got through in, in reasonable shape. Interestingly though, unemployment data don't quite match uh, the job creation data. Um, there's, a, there's a number of uh, reasons for that, and that can be because people who are losing their jobs don't necessarily register for New Start or for, for unemployment benefits. And so what you may have found is that, uh, that people simply weren't being recorded as unemployed when in fact they were in difficult circumstances. What is rather interesting and perhaps uh, is food for thought is to just look here in the last little period up until this date here, I'm sorry that you can't see that, is uh, the date for the start of this year which show uh, a, a tick up in unemployment, which is quite substantial. So that's uh, obviously something that, that is of interest and concern for Fremantle in terms of socioeconomic wellbeing, um, uh, in terms of the uh, overall socioeconomic performance of your population. The growth areas, the growth industries in terms of employment, were also rather interesting uh, as I worked through it, but perhaps no surprise if you're in and from Fremantle. So basically what we've shown here is those areas that grew at a faster rate between 2001 and 2011, the employment sectors, than the Perth metropolitan area, with the exception of mining. We put mining in there just as a bit of a comparator. You can see that it would seem, and we've done a bit more background work on this uh, for the final report, that Fremantle has some sort of advantages and is performing quite well at seeing around the healthcare and social assistance area. It's still doing okay around retail trade, which might come as a, as a surprise, but just note the date there. We don't have more recent data than 2011. Manufacturing is still performing relatively, uh, is still performing relatively well, as are, uh, as are a number of sectors. But again, the mining employment didn't grow nearly as quickly as, uh, as the Perth metropolitan area. But overall, it, show, it starts to point towards a number of industries that are performing relatively, uh, relatively well. We also decided to have a little bit of a look at com uh, commuter patterns. So what we've done here is mapped out commuter patterns for the entire nation. So this is basically where people live and where they work. You can't see all of the detail in this, it'll be much clearer in the bulletin if you, if you go online. But essentially what we're trying to show is that Fremantle is really highly connected. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily a little local labour market that, that performs in isolation. We have a lot of both uh, people flying out from Fremantle to other parts of the country to work, but also people coming from other parts of the country to work in Fremantle. So Fremantle is, is, is playing both sides of the equation, if you like, in terms of both supplying labour, but also attracting labour from, uh, from elsewhere. So I think that's important in terms of understanding your, your position in a national economy, you're not, you're not sort of sitting there in isolation. But also, even in the regional economy, there is a lot of movement to and from Fremantle. Um, and what we point out in the bulletin is that where people are going to work, people who live in Fremantle who go somewhere else, and where people are coming from to work in Fremantle are very different places. So we spell that out in a fair bit more detail in the bulletin. I think that, that also raises some interesting, um, some interesting questions that, uh, uh, that we can take up a little bit later. But what was also rather interesting to us was to not just look at your general demographics and to look at, uh, and to look at um, uh, your workforce, but to drill into this question of economic stress. So to ask that we, we've basically done some analysis that brings together data on unemployment benefits, uh, unemployment rates, and mean and median incomes to construct an index of socioeconomic stress. So the extent to which people might be feeling under some sort of, uh, some sort of significant pressure. Unfortunately, uh, in this table it's not highlighted, but the old core area of Fremantle performs poorly. Um, so there is evidence there that there is, a, there is a population there that is potentially experiencing some significant degree of socioeconomic stress. Uh, it'd be really interesting to hear from charity groups, welfare agencies and so on, whether, whether that matches their reality. But overall, um, the other parts of Fremantle don't <coughs> tend to perform too poorly and they tend to be pretty stable. So you see here, Freeman, the, the outer areas of Fremantle also are uh, uh, not as, perhaps, not perform, uh, performing not as well as they might, but out of these Fremantle, it's sort of in the mix with Subiaco and 
you know, those sorts of places. So not really surprised. So it would seem that there's a bit of a gradient from the core area as you move out. One of the other things we haven't presented, which is important, um, uh, which I haven't presented here, but which is in the bulletins, is the degree to which there is high levels of spatial inequality. So what we've done is we've looked at the degree to which there's a difference between the poorest areas in Perth and the wealthiest, and we find that there's a really big, big gap, quite a significant gap. In Fremantle, that's not nearly the case. It's much tighter. Um, it's, it's, it's a much more equal society in terms, of, in terms of space. So across locations, the gaps are not, are not as enormous as they are across the entire metropolitan area, which is, is broadly consistent with this, because the gap that I'm talking about is between 34th or 32nd, and about second rather than across large numbers of areas, if that makes sense. The last thing we wanted to look at was our trade. Um, and this was really just a way of looking at the question of connectivity. And we looked at, with some help uh, from uh, Fremantle Port, some, some data on flows of containers as a bit of a proxy for global connectivity. And what we found was that in just about, at the levels of trade with just about every country are up significantly. Not surprisingly, into Southeast Asia and East Asia with major growth around China, Singapore, Malaysia and so on. Hardly any places we saw significant declines. I think New Zealand might have been one and, and somewhere else um, uh, out of the top 20 or so. But you can see there are really strong connections with Asia, but importantly, strong global connections. So it's not, again, just a, a, a narrow sort of a, a set of trading relationships just with Southeast Asia. And what I particularly like about this, this work is, again, it shows that Fremantle isn't operating in isolation. It's part of a kind of a global economy. It's a really crucial uh, trade hub, and it's a really crucial economic hub within the, the, the Western Australian economy, but, but also within the national economy. So it's certainly not, um, it's certainly not uh, something that should be underestimated, I think. The other thing which was rather interesting to us, though, was to look at when, when um, goods hit Fremantle Port, where do they go to and where do they come from? And so, again, the bulletin will make this a little bit clearer, but we look at what, what uh, Fremantle Port's defined as pack and unpack locations. I was uh, particularly interested in the pack location, so in other words, goods that we're exporting. And what it showed, I thought, really quite nicely, was that Fremantle plays quite a critical role in supporting our exporters and not just in raw materials, but in things like high-value manufactured goods, um, in some high-value food processed uh, type goods and so on. We've got a little bit more work to do to unpack exactly what those industries are, but what it does suggest is that Fremantle Port is critical to the regional economy that, that surrounds it, particularly in terms of driving new jobs growth as a result of export uh, earnings. Unpacked locations are not particularly surprising in terms of where they are, Hugh uh, Welsh Port, so, so that's just a, a quick breeze through some of the key things that we found. I suppose if I was to try and sum it up and, you know, goodness, can I sum all of this stuff up in just a few points? It seems to me that in terms of population, what we have is fairly steady growth, nothing sort of out of the ordinary. Um, again, it can be, population growth can be interpreted in lots of different ways. A um, lot lower than the Perth metropolitan area, but in terms of rates of mobility and movement, not particularly different. <coughs> Aging population, but fairly slow rates of aging, and a fairly volatile labour force. Um, so, so employment seems to be more volatile than, than perhaps we might have um, expected. But a lot of complexity in the labour patterns. This is not a sort of a simple community or a simple economy to sort of wrap your head around. And that was one of the things that struck us, I think, as we were doing this work. In relative terms, economic stress is is high um, in a number of areas, but there is clearly a gradient. Um, but the overall gap between the wealthiest and the poorest is not that high. And I think, for me, one of the most interesting things is the critical role that Fremantle is still playing in the state and national economy through its trade networks. So that's sort of a, a, a quick summary of some of the things that we've found, certainly not all. Um, there's a lot more packed into those bulletins, and there's also a lot more to come um, uh, in that report on the 1st of December. So, Thanks, Matthew. So we're going to wait to do all the presentations first, um, and then we'll have some questions from the floor. Very happy to do that, and then there's some um, refreshments afterwards.
Okay, I'm going to spend about sort of 10 or 15 minutes um, going through what the community said through the surveys of both the city and the town of East Fremantle, and then looking for evidence to whether the perception uh, matches up with reality or not. And um, this is, um, I think some of it you're going to absolutely go there, no brainer, and some, some stuff's going to be a bit puzzling for you. So the aim of the presentation is to provide an overview of the perceived strengths and test that against reality and um, develop a greater understanding of the competitive advantages uh, and challenges for you. So the final report is going to be very much an evidence base but also strategies for the future and so we wanted to share these particularly with you today and get some sort of uh, feedback and responses. So we've looked at a number of documents. Uh, Committee for Perth always takes an evidence-based approach, so here are some of the key reference documents that we've looked at uh, as we've pulled this presentation together. So, strengths and weaknesses. Satisfaction with living in Greater Fremantle is high. Um, so 86% of the city's residents and 97% of the town's residents said they were very satisfied with living in the particular jurisdictions. Young people and renters are a little bit more likely in the city of Fremantle to be happier than those who are over 40 or homeowners. So that's, it's just a little variance in the, in the statistics, but we thought it was worthwhile um, bringing it to light. So what does the evidence tell us? That the satisfaction in life in the Fremantle region is high, uh, and that compares well with uh, Perth more generally. So we've just done the Perth Perception Survey, we repeated it for the second time. So we're actually comparing very recent statistics by straw polling in the greater Perth area and then looking at your surveys from last year. Heritage, and I'm also the Chair of the State Heritage Council and Hi up the back there. Um, no surprise to any of you, I'm sure, that heritage is strongly valued by the community. Uh, they particularly like built heritage and your major assets, the prison, the uh, Fremantle Arts Centre and the West End, you know, seen as a very intact uh, area. What was pleasing to see is there's a perception that there's an acknowledgement of the value of Indigenous heritage and that's increasing. And people very much value the um, sort of historic streetscape, I suppose, and the fact that it is at a human scale. And this certainly accords with work that we did with Project for Public Spaces uh, back in 2008 now. But we said, what are the best places in across the metropolitan area of Perth? What are the worst and what are the most with opportunity? And Fremantle certainly came up as one of the best places and the reflection on that was because it is at a human scale. So there was a minority of people that felt that um, heritage protection seemed to uh, impede development and investment. So the evidence tells us that Indigenous and European heritage is strongly valued and we think it's a unique competitive advantage for you, that it's a str strong attractor of uh, tourists and visitors, and um, you have had a reputation as a place difficult to invest and I hope that that's turning around with the work that the city's doing um, more recently. In terms of arts and culture, you've got a very strong festival program and a high quality of arts and cultural assets and they are very much valued by your community. The evidence tells us that the festival program that you have here is unique and you've got, uh, is locally significant and you've got a lot of your local residents supporting those. Uh, you have had um, a decrease in your performing, art, performing arts venues and what you've probably seen is that there's been a greater regional competition for festivals and probably uh, the Fringe Festival being in the heart of the city has been one of the sort of big, uh, big things that's come along to erode some of your um, festival activity. So in terms of having a diverse and creative community, there's a perception that you certainly are and that's helped to uh, shape your unique sense of character and sense of place. And the evidence tells us that uh, you're not significantly more multicultural than across greater metropolitan Perth, but you do have higher proportions of Italian, Croatian and Portuguese heritage, and that gives you a, an added layer to your community. It certainly helped shape your unique heritage, your restaurant and cafe culture, and you have, uh, you're a very smart community, you should be very proud of yourselves. You've got a higher proportion of people with qualifications in sectors such as society, culture, creative arts, natural and physical science, architecture and building. So um, you're certainly faring better than some of the other areas. Tourism and hospitality. Your residents do value the cafes, restaurants and the offerings, 
but there is some criticism that perhaps there's a lack of diversity. And one of our steering committee members said, where do I go to get good Thai? So that was a reflection back on uh, probably more of the Italian uh, layering here. So the evidence tells us that uh, you've been a significant regional restaurant and cafe hub since the middle of last century. Uh, that tourism is a major local strength, uh, with Fremantle being the second greatest uh, destination visited uh, other outside of the CBD in 2013. A relatively small percentage of your visitors stay overnight, so that's obviously an opportunity for the future. And you've had a lot of um, competition, so re you know, regional competition in terms of Coburn, Melville and uh, what's happened up in Claremont. But if you just think about the changing landscape in cross Greater Perth, there's been the deregulation of the retail trading hours, so you're not a specialist retail trading hub, particularly on the Sundays anymore. Uh, and there's been so many more restaurants and cafes and small bars pop up across mm -hmm. Perth. Fremantle Port obviously plays a critical role in the economy, uh, in the sense of history and unique sense of place. And we believe that there needs to be capitalising on the port through marketing and promotional activities and better integration with the port and the city centre. And what does the evidence tell us? Uh, that Fremantle Port will remain important to the future. The cruise ship destination is expected to go, and that's good new growth, and that's good news. Um, the maritime related sectors that have been your sort of traditional employment, such as transport, postal, and warehousing, have decreased over the past decade, but you have had uh, an increase in professional, scientific, and technical and construction. So it's a bit of a sort of rebalancing out and probably more towards the new economy. In terms of education, this institution is seen as one of your great strengths, along with Challenger TAFE and very strongly valued by the community. You're a small but vibrant education hub. It's a major employer in the region. Uh, you've got high levels of human capital and you've got a unique advantage of being a true university city. In terms of health, uh, your role as a health hub was recognised by your community and it's strongly valued, particularly by those who are uh, older in your community. The evidence tells us that the healthcare and social assistance sector has been the largest employer, providing in excess of 15% of your full-time job equivalents. But of course the regional role of Fremantle Hospital and employment has decreased with Fiona Stanley Hospital coming online. In terms of the environment, re residents strongly value the local environment. A lot of people have talked in your surveys about being close to the coast and river um, and uh, the foreshore. But there's a perception that Fremantle is a leader in environmental protection and responding to climate change. However, there's no evidence to suggest that, so that's probably one of the things you'll want to lynch me about. Um, but you have got a relatively unique uh, environmental setting. In terms of economic development, residents are concerned about the economic future for the Greater Fremantle region, specific concerns around the development in the city centre, and there's a perception that vacancy rates are high. So the evidence tells us uh, that there's been a sort of relatively stagnant um, in, uh, economic development profile in the last decade. You have had higher vacancy rates in your CBD. Job growth has been significantly lower than the state as a whole. And recent in, uh, investment in employment growth has had a positive impact. So there's some bad news and some good news in there. Parking and traffic, and I was asked about this when I was interviewed by the media earlier today. So residents have an ongoing concern about parking in Fremantle and it's consistently identified as a weakness. Traffic is also identified as a weakness but significantly less than parking. And uh, there's concern that traffic has increased um, and it's to do with freight. So what does the evidence tell us? Uh, you're highly reliable. So here you say you're a very eco-friendly community, but we actually see you as being quite dependent on your private cars, and that could be because the public transport offering is not strong within your actual um, finer grain streets, whereas you've obviously got the heavy rail system coming down, and I know that the city's been a big proponent for light rail. So while there are some congested roads in Fremantle, they're less congested as, uh, as uh, against central Perth. And the City of Fremantle studies indicate that parking problems may actually be associated with accessibility rather than the number of car bays. And certainly I think when you look at people's perception who live outside of Fremantle, it's like, I just don't understand the one-way system, I don't know where to park, I'll just go somewhere else. 
Crime and safety. The perception is that residents are concerned about crime and antisocial behaviour, particularly around the city centre, and that often comes with having a nighttime economy. What the evidence suggests to us is that the crime rates in Fremantle are slightly higher than other areas in the region, and as I said, probably comes from that nighttime economy, which is both a good and a bad thing to have. Um, there's no evidence though that it's significantly higher than elsewhere across Perth. And the fact that your residents are concerned about crime is very consistent with our recent straw polling of the broader Perth community. Housing diversity and affordability. Residents have identified a need for increased housing diversity uh, in the central area. They definitely want to see more diverse housing across the region. Businesses have identified the need to have a critical mass of people living in the downtown. And there's an, an issue about affordability and that certainly stacks up across Perth. So the evidence tells us uh, by looking at the Curtin and Bankwest uh, report that uh, Fremantle is the fifth least affordable region in Perth. The inner city resident population has declined in that census year 2006 to 11. And the housing stock is actually more diverse and you would have seen more of that coming on stream. It would be interesting to see when we uh, do the census is repeated next year and we do the analytics in 17, the difference the granny flats have made to your fabric. So, as I said, there's some food for thought there. There's probably some conventional wisdoms that you totally agree with and others that you may not agree with, and we'll leave that for question time. And Brad, over to you. Thank you, and thanks for coming along. Really, really good to see so many of you here. Um, I'm going to fly through a presentation that I know a couple of you have saw a few weeks ago um, and with, it's got some minor tweaks in relation to what we're talking about today. Um, but I had, when it was in June, I, I went to um, about, it was a dozen cities in a dozen days basically. Um, so it was, it was a pretty, it was a pretty extraordinary trip um, organised by the West Australian Local Government Planning Association. And what we did was looked at what um, Professor Peter Hall saw as the most livable and sustainable cities in Europe, and those were predominantly located within Northern Europe. And so I'm going to try and capture some of the things, lessons that I learnt, um, and then link it a little bit um, back to Chuck Wolf's book at, 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 at the end, which is uh, certainly um, a very stimulating read and something I'd, I'd, I'd recommend. But there was no doubt that everywhere I went, did something very different to Perth. And that was starting around that idea around density, but not just any density, it was density done well. And the reason density is important is I, I often, I like, well, I hate this photo and like it, but, but, because, but because it's what you, it is what's happening right now. And this could be taken any time in the last 20 years on the northern beaches of Perth where we're bulldozing our way um, north and south to try and accommodate the the, the, the growth in our population. And I guess this is a form of density, a very low form of density, and it's, in my view, it, well, it's done well from a suburban sense, but it's not done well from a sustainability or a livability sense, because this is a biodiversity hotspot, as many of you would know. Um, it's actually, and we're creating, ultimately, I think, communities that are not livable or sustainable in the longer term. Um, but. Perth has this funny reaction to density, and I just put this photo up of East Perth, where we kind of feel like it's, it's this choice, you can either choose a tower or you can choose a, a block on the urban fringe. And what I, what I found fantastic about this trip was actually realising there's a really important bit in between. And I think this is where um, Fremantle fits really nicely, which is around this diverse density, and there's not a magic answer to this. Um, it may, this is a, from Malmo, uh, the Western Harbour, which um, they did an extraordinary redevelopment of their harbour front there, and they actually had a range of densities um, all the way through to Hamburg and Freiburg. But, you have this, but there was a sense of this magic number, but it could be between four to eight floors, um, which is I, I think we, we saw most often, and, and it's a very European scale. But that didn't, didn't mean there was no taller buildings. And in fact, I, I mean, one of the things is they did, they did, but when they did tall buildings, they were landmarks and they did them really well. And this was Malmo's Western Harbour, which has the extraordinary uh, the twisting torso building right at, right at the heart of what's predominantly a, a medium scale development. What this density meant also, though, was that these cities became cities of short distances. And this is a, this is a, a, 
a quote that Wolf Dusterking, who from Freiburg uses, he said, this is great cities are cities of short distances. And again, I come back to Perth to show we don't do that very well. Our cities are cities of long distances and frustrating commutes. And that's in many ways what we've been designing because we do spread our uses out and we don't mix our uses up. And to come back to another example from Malmo, from this photo, and I guess it's not immediately apparent, but I could see residential apartments, hotels, offices, a supermarket, a cafe, a childcare centre, all within, all, all in this photo. And what that meant for me was and I think for the residents who live there, was it was a very livable, compact, walkable place um, and one that, that worked. And Freiburg, a very similar thing. Um, in fact, Freiburg, I just put, put this up, in, in Vauban, which is a new district on the edge, actually were very clear about wanting to make this a city of short distances. And you can see there from that slide all the, all the education and childcare places, the grocery stores, the, the, pub, the, the public transport, the chemists, the banks, all of those things. So you don't need to travel long distance on a daily basis because everything is within walking distance of where you live. This one is quite radical and I, I really liked what was happening around cars and the idea that you don't design your suburbs around them. Just to flick through some photos here, which is R R R Rice Field, in, um, which is off in, in near Freiburg in Germany. Um, this was in, actually in Copenhagen, where I love that a city, this, this street actually had taken back the, um, it's actually a, 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 a sand pit and a child's play box, this is actually in, in the road reserve. I was thinking, I was thinking about City of Freeman are trying to get uh, <laughs> approval for this. Um, but, but what it meant was that cars could still go through here, but you had to drive slowly and give way to people, because this was actually, the street was a place that people inhabited. And we saw this all through Europe. And it was a very different way of thinking about cars. Cars could still go everywhere. They just, they just were, had to give way to people. Um, and people, if you wanted to park your car, though, you can't park it in front of your house. You didn't have a driveway. Um, you had a garage on the edge of the city where you would, where, where you would park your car. And Vauban actually, as you can see, all of the green zones here were designed without a parking space in front of the house. People still had the option of parking. Um, and there certainly were parking spaces within the red zones if you wanted to live that. But it meant that people didn't use their cars nearly as much, or even in cases actually have cars. It was a choice. They had a choice to not, in a way that we don't have that choice very easily for most of us in Western Australia, in Perth, you, where you needing a car is, is essential. And you can see there where Perth, you have about 65 cars for every 100 people. In Vauban, where I was showing you, it's 16. It's uh, very, very different. And it was all through, you had this idea that we're parking on the fringe. Um, and I, I think for me, this was a really inspiring idea around how we could start to rethink our cities. Um, and uh, an, another example here from Copenhagen where car parks can actually be quite beautiful if you design them well. And uh, this one actually has affordable housing sitting on top of it. And um, there's a view back, 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 back the other way of the, of, of, the, of the same development. And you have this sense of um, very different ways of thinking about parking and our cities, but also meant much more opportunity for green spaces and public spaces. Essential was tying in with that, the idea that you have a really strong focus up front on investment in public transport and cycling. So you can't just not provide cars and then not provide anything else. And what, um, this is actually Ricefield on, on the outskirts of uh, of Freiburg, an old, an old sewerage works, right? Basically, on, you can see it's on the ur very urban fringe of, 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 their, of their area. They ran their tram system, was running before anyone moved in to this area. So you can see the density of that area, it's on the fringe, it's a much denser core, but they actually had people, they actually had a, a light rail system running before people moved in. And that was really important because that was about getting people thinking very differently about how they would move around the city. They didn't get used to their cars. And this one here as well, the parking was largely on, on the edge of the city. And you can see the, 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 the image of it running down the middle of the street there. Um, same with um, Vauban. It's very much these spines, these green spines running down the centre of these areas that contain the public transport. Similarly with cycling. Putting that infrastructure in was really important. 
from really simple things like paint on a road here, here in Copenhagen to here in Hamburg where we have very well separated cycling lanes um, through to a $7 million bridge for cyclists only. There was all, all, kinds, of, all kinds of infrastructure across the city. And again, I want to, there's some really important point I want to hear is that all of these were choices. Europe wasn't born with great cycling lanes or great public transport. They made choices because they saw that this was the kind of city that they wanted to live in. And they invested in this for decades. And you can see Copenhagen, Amsterdam, all of those were in decline in the 60s and 70s in terms of cycling as well, just like we were. Fremantle, Fremantle, Perth were cycling cities as well, if you go back to World War, to, to before World War II. Um, but they chose very deliberately to invest and invest in cycling and get it back, back, back up. And as a result, um, Copenhagen, for example, 45% of their mode share getting to work or education institutions is by bike. Perth, a bit under 2%, just to give you a bit of, bit, bit of contrast. But of course it has its own, own challenges around parking bikes and, you know, there was certainly, that was one of the, you know, it's a very Perth thing to take photos of, I think, because we just don't, don't have this issue. But I'd, I just kind of get more and more, is outside uh, the main train station in Amsterdam where they, a whole different kind of multi-storey park <coughs> that, that we don't have here, here in, and, um, but it certainly was pretty extraordinary. And even in Malmo they decided they just ran out of room so had to float a barge um, to, to hold them. And f green spaces is another really important one. Um, obviously, a really major provision of high quality green spaces and more of it. This idea of 10% POS we do in, in WA. Actually, you'll see here, you've got actually, um, which, is, which is again Freiburg, um, retaining mature trees, often 30% POS was 20 to 30% was, was pretty normal. Using what you've got, layering up. I mean, I quite liked, and I don't know how clear this is, on the, you can actually see where they, this is actually an old military base, when they kept all the trees and you can see where they actually had the protections to stop the tanks hitting them in Freiburg um, and actually using that and that making that a key part of the place they were creating. Um, and the, the old sewerage works um, in, in, in Ricefeld are similar, you know, kind of very much taking a very uh, key and, and very um, lots of small parks and a really strong focus on families and children which is really important. Renewable energy probably seems obvious now, uh, but there was a, everywhere we went, um, there was renewable energy, with it. Whole sides of uh, buildings in Freiburg, the tops of, um, even Zara has gone, uh, has, has decided that they needed uh, to, you, you, know, you know solar's gone mainstream and Zara, Zara has actually, as, as, their so, as their shop front, and this is, uh, Apparently the greenest hotel in the world in Copenhagen. It just looks like a black building, I guess, like that. But if you look a bit closer, the whole of that building is actually made of, of is actually capturing renewable energy. Um, and I think this is the future where we've, we've crossed a key threshold point now and it's partly because it's just so cheap. Um, and we're going to see the same with battery technology over, over the next few years, um, where renewables, thankfully, uh, are so competitive now that it's going to actually start to transform um, this is even using this to heat spaces. Um, these are actually solar hot water heaters. And even using your garbage, um, which is to, to, to actually food scraps and those kinds of things in Malmo. Every sink has one of these under it. And then that uh, ultimately powers the majority of their bus fleet. This is actually from uh, Bristol, where they're actually using waste uh, human sewerage to power their bus fleet. But we actually have a very different idea about how we think about energy and waste. And then finally, looking at affordable housing. Um, what was amazing is how diverse the housing was. Uh, this is actually a, a co-op development, but it's not a co-op in a hippie kind of co-op way that we think about them here. It's actually what they call a terminating co-op, which is basically uh, or build together, was what they called them in, Germ in Germany. It was a very common way of where people would build together. Now, this was done because it made housing much more affordable. In fact, 20 to 30% more affordable as a general rule. And all through Germany, we saw examples of these. In fact, take Vauban once again as an example. You can see probably about half the developments in Vauban were actually built through this co-op model, through this terminating co-op model. Uh, because people could build what they needed. They might want to build a house which has a, a separate 
unit that everyone can rent as relatives come and stay because you're living in, in a unit. One even had a whole floor that was dedicated to people who had Alzheimer's disease um, so, that, so that the families could still live in the same proximity to them but they could have a carer and actually those people could be within a, a, a specially built location. It's about building together and planning together for what you actually need rather than buying off the plan. So there's a, this is just a quote from Peter Hall who wrote the book, basically it was a textbook that we used on, on our tour, that Northern Europe now consistently produces better quality urban developments with more affordable housing, higher environmental standards and far greater spending on green spaces, infrastructure and public transports. And I think that was true, but I guess what I wanted to say though, that, that was because they made they weren't, weren't born with it, they made those lots of small choices that got them there. And I just like this before and after photo of a street in, 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 in Amsterdam and you can see that they have many of the same challenges that we have on our streets now where pedestrian cyclists are crowded out by cars and traffic and of course you can see there's a whole the same street several years later with a whole range of different choices. But to link that back and um, to Chuck Wolf's book I, and, and back to Fremantle, um, I don't want you to go away to think there is, there is a cookie cutter magic solution that we just take from this and then, and then apply to Fremantle. That's not the way that it works. And I think what, what I came away with was lots of inspiration, but also realising that we've got a whole series of different complexities here. And when Fremantle's future is going to be around actually building on this idea that we need to take our place and actually work within our strengths and our, and, and our context. And Fremantle, we're very lucky. It was a city designed and built before the car. It is a walking city. It is a city that was had, had trams and public transport at its heart. That is a working city that had affordable housing. Um, and I think we can do all those things and we can actually change in a way that I think is a very Fremantle kind of way. Um, but also coming back to the, the reports that, that, we've been, that, that have been talked about today that can actually build upon the strengths whilst addressing those weaknesses that are clearly already within, within our economy and we need pretty clearly more people living in Fremantle, more people working in Fremantle and more people visiting it for it to work. Um, but, but for me it was really inspiring that we can take the best of Europe and start to apply it in a unique freer way. So um, thank you for listening to my very brief version of uh, what, what I learned from Europe. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. I also get to travel the world and look at cool places. I try to go to big metropolises, ones that are growing at a faster rate than the national average, like the Perth metropolitan region has been. I've been to some great places, places that have inspired me. I've also been to some absolute hell holes that we would never want to do. But on that note, one of the places that I was very enchanted with was Seattle. So I think there is an affinity between the west coast of the US and Canada and the west coast of Australia. So some of my favourite cities are Portland, Seattle and Vancouver. And uh, my only glitch in Seattle was talking on the phone to my husband saying, this place is really gorgeous and the harbour's fantastic. And these people tapped me on the shoulder and they said, ma'am, are you from Australia? And I said, yes. And they said, we're from Oklahoma City. And how do you guys get away without having guns? <laughs> and then they went to great lengths to explain they weren't from Seattle. So I understand Seattle people are a little bit more liberal, attuned maybe. <laughs> like Frio, yeah, exactly. So um, as I said, Lyle Bicknell came out uh, after I had visited Seattle in 2013. He came out last year to further the discussion about planning for light rail. And I got an email out of the blue saying, Marion met Chuck, Chuck met Marion. Um, Chuck's got this half Australian fiance and they love to come and so she can sort of interact with her family and connect with her roots. And Chuck would be very happy to come and talk at some sort of public forum on his work. And we are absolutely <coughs> delighted to have you. So attorney, thinker, critiker sometimes maybe, someone who has a bit of a critique going on. Um, intrepid traveller, um, photographer. I've seen some great photos up on Facebook of some of the things that he's seen. Um, and I think has a, a genuine love of Australia and of his half Australian woman. So without further ado, Chuck. <laughs> Well, thanks very much to everyone and particularly uh, 
the true story that Marianne just told in terms of the many influences that got me here. There's some other influences that you'll hear about in a moment having to do with my urban planning professor father and a trip that I never took in um, far too long ago um, to Western Australia. I've been to Australia a couple of times before, but never over here, and I'm certainly based on this magical drive, had the immersion tour. So uh, I, I hope, while not being, uh, you know, as Lyle said, because I watched Lyle's video from when he was here, you know, I'm not going to walk off the plane and tell you what to do, but I hope I can convey some um, organic understanding of, of both the state and, and the country. Um, so we have a phrase in America that um, my, my knowledge of Australian English is a bit, but it, 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 it I think is particularly evocative here because I've listened carefully to Matthew and and um, to um, to Ms. Folker and to Brad and 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 it's kind of like what Brad said, what Marion said, what Matthew said. Because um, what I'm going to do is uh, accept pretty much all that's been presented and go back behind it all and take us back to some very fundamental human universals in terms of relationships between people and place, um, city residents and their environments, and what we all want, which I think was implicit in uh, much of what has been said already. And I, I always, especially lately, given um, the travel that I've been fortunate enough, both with, with Fiona and through my dad over the years, to this travel I've been fortunate enough to undertake, you begin to see things um, sort of like what Marion just said, well, the west coast of the United States has a lot in common with west coast of Australia. But you see even deeper than that. And for those of you who've traveled, maybe you understand. You see commonalities that are, you know, um, twi twin sons of different mothers, but magically the same. And so I always lately like to start with this photo from Tanzania and this photo from Seattle. And, um, I like to say that they're the same photo. Look at the, the dynamic of street life in Arusha, Tanzania, in front of the Charles shop, no accident there. Um, and, you know, it's, although we've got coffee culture Seattle here, not unlike Cappuccino Row here in, in Fremantle, you know, they're, it's, it's mysteriously the same, down to the woman parked, in this case, with her cell phone and. Um, the street dyna dynamic is remarkably similar, even regardless of transportation mode. And if you can crank back and understand urban life based on much more fundamental principles than, um, and I mean no disrespect, the latest best practices from overseas, I think it's a very important step before you go forward to crank back. And as you'll hear, I, I, I came to that understanding through some through osmosis from my father and some through 30 years of law practice and watching people try to get things done. Now we have a tendency once we go overseas and th see great things and Brad was great in pointing out avoid the cookie cutter approach and I'm very flattered that you actually read some of what I've written but um, you'll recognize a piece of Fremantle here and you'll recognize um, other places, Vaison La Romain in, in Provence, in France, with the more conventional chairs in the square. And something that's just occurred in Seattle, we have a pavement to parks program, which really should be called people to parks because they're not really parks, it's more the parklet um, um, out of San Francisco. But the idea is take an intersection, paint it over, put some tables in, put up some barriers, hope to God that some crazy from Oklahoma City doesn't drive through and mow people down. Um, seriously. Um, and it's great because as Seattle densifies, and we've got a lot of pressures, just like the booms have been here, but ours are very much ongoing, giving Amazon and Starbucks and Microsoft and Facebook coming to town and Google and you know, you name it. There is a need for open space, but I'm concerned about quality. This is my critic side that Marion alluded to. I'm concerned about quality. I'm concerned about uh, another American phrase, keeping up with the Joneses and doing cool things without thinking about context. And uh, this little pavement to park, which is 
sort of the first major, quasi-major one in terms of actually blocking off an intersection. People are using it, but there's something lacking. And I'm not quite sure what it is, but I think it's at the human scale. And it's just something to think about going forward. Um, this is a photograph that I took in downtown Seattle that's gotten a lot of attention. And this is another re-engineered city space in a Westlake Park, which you may remember. Marianne, I don't know if you saw it. Those of you who've been in Seattle may, may know it. Um, there have been problems with gangs, with drugs, with petty thievery and not so petty thievery. And so what has happened right now is this is managed by the Downtown Seattle Association. It's if, it's as, as if the Committee for Perth went into partnership with the city and took over with a private contract and ran the parks or ran a public place. Uh, you know, in front of the old post office and so on and so forth. Um, and they're trying things. They're trying air hockey. They're trying large chess pieces and so on and so forth. But it creates these magical photos that if you stand there long enough, you, you, can, um, you can take in and then you can run around the world and greenwash with them if you like or you can ask, why is this happening? And I'm not one to prescribe, I'm one to ask a lot of annoying questions and leave them with you as you go forward here in Freo because I note a lot of things, um, and we've talked about it already, there's a lot of universals. And if you think about a be best practice locally, are the chess pieces necessarily the magic, the silver bullet, as we also like to say. So this is in Avignon, in France, with a street mime and the captivated child. and the real beginning of the presentation. The book was, as you'll hear a little bit more about, and what city is that, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, OK, so you can see I've been to Australia before. But um, the, uh, the book was a, my own reaction to my on-the-job learning. And a crank back, and this is um, this, this last, the, the quotations you can see on the Island Press website. Some people have said some very kind things about the richness of the photographs and what um, messages are conveyed. But it's a focus on context, as, as, as Brad introduced. It's a focus on these fundamentals that I've alluded to. On the right, in Lisbon, on the Afama Hill, something you could have seen a couple hundred years ago or more. On the left, Pike Place Market in Seattle and the gum wall, a, a, literally chewing gum on bricks that's become a major tourist attraction. Why? People chew gum, right? It's, a, you know, it's one of these fundamentals, and it's kind of gross. Um, and they clean it off once a year, and there you go. Um, so when I tell the backstory of the book, I like to talk about the first principles of places, which um, Brad summarized through Sir Peter in some respects, this idea of the walkable, compact development that um, has all the good, sustainable language built into it. We need not dwell on it. You can read it. But this has become, in city making, somewhat of an, an inherent goal. And when the Project for Public Spaces was here, um, the, this stands behind their work. It stands behind a lot of work. But then there's a lot of other things that can be easily left out. Housing prices can shoot up. Um, issues of safety, equity, social justice sometimes get lost. And that's part of our common and universal challenge. So what is urbanism without effort? It's a bit of an oxymoron. Um, I, had a, I had a speaker from London in Scotland last year look down at me at the podium after I was spoken and said, I'm sorry, Chuck, there's no such thing as urbanism without effort. Of course, there is no such thing. But sometimes I would argue when you hit things on all fours, when you evoke those magical human qualities that really are um, reflective of time immemorial, you can get some essence that you can run with going forward. So simplicity-based, it's a crank back from Copenhagen solar panels and so on, but I think it's absolutely essential. Now, this doesn't always need a big city. And I like to tell the story of, this is, to some degree, this is true of any settlement, any village. Um, any, any cattle station, any, uh, any town. Um, I like to, uh, who's traveled to Malta, the island country? And, okay, so the, the old capital city of Malta, 
was right out of Tolkien, the city on the hill with the orcs fighting down in front of it, um, Medina. And the area around it, Rabat, now much larger. If you go back to the origins of the Maltese dialect, which is essentially, as I understand, an 8th century Arabic, what do these words mean? Medina means city, Rabat means suburb in simple translation. Rabat's now a lot bigger than Medina. These things morph over time and then go back again. And so when, when we think about urban and urbanism, we're really not just talking about the central city. We're talking about morphing elements in the region, which is very opportune both here and uh, around the world. I like to reference the work of an architectural historian um, who um, um, was at the University of Pennsylvania, and his background is very interesting. He was born in Poland, was somewhat a victim of the diaspora during the World, world War II, and um, lived a lot of places. And that, um, in, in another book, not The Seduction of Place, but The Idea of a Town, he points out just that, that, you know, the city, to some degree, we try and create all these constructs for what makes a great city, but it's in, within all of us. It's a dream. And so that's another thing that I love to point out, that the individual conception and fostering that individual conception, be it through public comment or diary making or observation, which I'm going to talk a lot more about, is critically important. And to allow people to understand their surroundings and encourage them to do so, I think is just so important to uh, what we're all wrapped up in. And so Riker brought that out in me in some of the research and reading that I've done. Also, for those of you who love urbanism books, um, these are folks who just come through Seattle and I've, I've become very friendly with Charles Montgomery on the right, the happy city. Has he been through Perth? Yeah, um, yeah, he's Canadian, um, Vancouver, just like Gordon Price. And Charles um, looks at these issues from a more quantitative and, and, and study simple study-based perspective about what makes people resonate with a place. On the left, um, Jaime Lerner, the former mayor of Curitiba in Brazil, which, who, who accomplished all of these things with small budgets back in the 80s. And um, my publisher, Island Press, recently translated his book, Urban Acupuncture. Um, and the idea of pinpricks, little things you can do that you're already doing here in Frio because you can read it. Um, um, but little things at small costs that can remake an area. So I urge you to take a look at these guys work as well, and there's tons of others, but I've just been recently influenced by their work, light rail, transit. We all know how important that is. Um, mm -hmm. That's why Lyle came down from Seattle. Um, Brad talked about it appropriately as so essential. But I'm going to get off the train of the truisms, no pun intended, and talk about why. Well, it's not just the importance of connectivity and bringing one closer to one's workplace or where one plays and does business of other sorts. We, I think, in um, talking about all this on a regular basis are trying to create what Professor Chapman at the University of California, Los Angeles has talked about as the OD, um, a veiled drug reference, I guess, but, but TO, TOD can also be split off. Forget about the transit. The qualities that we're seeking, this great urbanism is essentially TOD without the T. And so in the United States, we have had a tendency to overemphasize simply TOD without really understanding what it means. And based on some work I did in Seattle, on, as not on my lawyer side, um, that sort of inspired this urbanism without effort stuff. Because it's, wait a minute, it's not just TOD, it's these qualities that stand behind the idea. And so my story. I've already alluded to a bit, and uh, Marianne kindly in, the in her introductions. Um, I realized as I was arguing for and against projects, working for cities or private sector clients, that there was something else going on. Even when, as, as, as an advocate, I was on the side of victory. It's like, wait a minute. There's something else going on here. Why is this project? succeeding. And it's not just that we've hit the legal criteria correctly. 
there's these fundamental relationships that are underneath and I decided I needed to go figure out what they were. And um, so what are they? And how do we capture them and transmute them in a useful way going forward? And the idea of context, which we a word we've used several times already, and age value, how different points in a city's history inform one another and make a place unique are very important, as well as this idea of urban observation and the diary, what I call in the book the urban diary. So for me, 30 years on the job, my father's teachings by osmosis, the fact that I lived and worked in Connecticut in the eastern United States where the New England town created a more um, direct example for me and also some things that I saw in our own neighborhood in Seattle. And I inferred from those the same things that we're talking about in, in Northern Europe or what we all want. Walkable and sitable, proximate, connectivity, shared resources that are more sustainable, et cetera, et cetera. Through my father, I learned a lot just on the job, this osmosis that I've alluded to. And, you know, this was monkey see, monkey do. When I was 13 years old, I took this picture in Croatia, what is now Croatia, because he was sitting here, next here, sketching. And this was monkey see, monkey do with one of those old Instamatic cameras. And um, it was like, okay, I was 13 when I, th I took that. I've sort of done some internal rediscovery and tried to infer what the heck I must have been doing. From my dad, I, I um, and this is sort of how you do it. How, you, how do you find the urbanism without effort? From my dad, I learned when you go to a place, you do all sorts of things to immerse. And um, you can think of what they might be in, the, in, the, in this region. But this is the example, what I call the Via Appia method in Rome. You take a local train eight kilometers out to a military base, you get off at a little town called Tarikula, and you walk on a very busy road, and then you find the historic Via Appia, and you march into Rome pretending you're a centurion a couple of thousand years ago. And it's great fun, and you look around, and you, it's, you know, it's the experience of walking into Rome. Anybody know or remember what these ruins are along the road? Tombs of the rich. Because at some point, by regulation, Rome was too dense for cemeteries or even the catacombs at the edge. Another tidbit from history that we can replicate <laughs> going forward. Um, there's been some great urban observers out there. And there's an American journalist named Grady Clay who said what you can read here it's like, people, why are you in such a hurry to ride the, the next wave? Uh, you have it within yourselves to go out and look and help figure it all out. So again, that's this, the adages of observation, and no one knows how to do it than in a southern Italian town. <laughs> They're observing. Um, or in Portugal and Lisbon, getting the look and feel just on, on, on the old town or trying to document what the heck an urban diary is, which I do in the book, and I've written some articles about it, and I'll leave this to your quick review because we don't have a whole lot of time here today. But this is how you might do an urban diary, and it, I'm, I'm a fanatical photographer, but that doesn't need to be you. You can, you can do something else in the way that you recognize the relationships of where you live to what you do every day and figure out why the heck it's so inefficient given your automobile and the state of the roads, your distance from tr heavy rail or potential light rail or, or, or whatever. But I think it's a very important exercise and I've seen it. Um, I know Adelaide has done some work, for instance, also with the help from Project for Public Spaces where as part of the planning process, they crowdsource photos. What's your favorite place? Tell us your story. And those types of inputs can be, I think, tremendously helpful rather than a more top-down. Uh, and, you know, you, some of you know this and have participated, but I think, again, it's worth noting. Um, I've written stuff very recently amid all the change in Seattle, and the short story here is looking, I, I was walking along and looked at a view, and I remembered what used to be an enormous theater that stood at the spot of this hotel 
where right behind Amazon World Headquarters are, 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 are going on. And my point was not this nostalgic preservation heritage edict. It was like, oh my god, no one here even knows what was here before. And that, it might be helpful in planning how we go forward to understand that, even if the structures are not there. So I wrote this article, the preservationists, or what you would call heritage folks, loved it. But that wasn't even my point. So um, just a tidbit. So um, imagery. Imagery of this walkable sitable. I, I, I once wrote an article called The Sitable City, kind of making fun of Jack Speck's The Walkable City. And it was very popular. Why? OK, I don't know, other than it hit this note that I'm alluding to. We've always walked. This is the first recorded hominid walk in Tanzania at Olduvai Gorge, the, the plaster cast um, reconnected. This is why we went and saw the dinosaur footprints in Broom. Same stuff. Uh, <laughs> Portland, Oregon, um, infusing the greenery that Brad mentioned and the importance of, of the, in the importance of the urban landscape. Do you guys, have you guys tried the pianos here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, this is in Vancouver. Um, these are just more images of what makes us comfortable and feel good. But remember, this is a way of life in some parts of the world. This is not engineered. This is in Bargemont, in Provence, in France. And it's people doing what people do, sitting around at the cafe on a summer afternoon. And in an Italian square, children playing. And I'm not trying to greenwash. I'm just trying to talk about what it is that is organic, natural, and human. Now, actually, up in Broome, we were talking to a, to a couple who said that up in Broome, they noticed, because it was the um, end of the Pearl um, Festival up there, and they had um, the serpents on the beach and the fireworks. and they were a couple from Sydney, and they noticed how far afield the children were and how people up there didn't seem to be as concerned as we Anglo-American types tend to be. And this is something that I had thought about, and I'm no um, environmental psychologist, but I did a little <coughs> article on tether distance um, between London, looking at London and the Corsican city of Bastia in France. And this, there's this, there's in Bastia, there's a big square that's the site of an old hospital and a line of cafes along the edge, as you can see in the inset. And that little arrow is my crude attempt to show how far away the parents were letting the kids go um, and why. And so, in other words, this telephoto of these two guys talking to each other, their parents were way back in cafe chairs, but they were in line of sight. So line of sight, the great American journalist turned urban advocate Jane Jacobs, eyes to the street, eyes on the street, and that's where some of this comes from. Um, even more so. <laughs> we rebuild in terms of what is behind urban and the Moyad effort, we rebuild. We like to rebuild. On the Greek island of Paros, somebody created a wall. They didn't have much money. What did they do? They reused. After the great Lisbon earthquake, 1755, royalty ran away to Blem, but the Marcus de Pombal was left behind to re-engineer the city with the same Georgian architecture that was going on in Edinburgh because it was more resistant to earthquakes in the future. We talk about in Seattle the need for an emblematic high line like New York or in Paris with a park and a rail right of way. And I went around and said, wait a minute, we already have high lines. Why do we need to retain James Corner, the landscape architect, when we are already reusing our former rail structures? You can find this stuff if you look around. What really inspired Urbanism Without Effort was an article I wrote for the digital form of the Atlantic Magazine a couple of years ago. We live on an alley in Seattle, a lane, a close. Um, and um, through no urban organized program, through no city program, 
only an email between neighbors, our alley turns into a movie theater in the summer. Okay? And, of course, people have adopted this. Um, there are and you may have them in this region. We've seen them in Melbourne, certainly, the idea of these movie, you know, the movies at night. But the point here is, this is where urbanism without effort came from. And I said in that article, and maybe it's the best urbanism at all, of all. So, vignettes, places of comfort and scale, Neil's Yard in London now, gentrified and redeveloped to look quite different. This is about 12, 13 years ago. But the scale, stood the test of time, and then gentrified, um, is instructive. The outlier, the original ghetto from the, where the word came from in Venice. The Jews worked out in the community. They were closed up in an island at night. Thousands of people without enough room to live, so they built up. This is where we have, I think, at least in the United States, a real concern with density and why we argue about density done well or density done right because there's, I think there's memories of density that was either had evil motivation, it was unsafe, unhealthy, and so on. Important consideration. The importance of the corner. I know you have spaces here in town, but the importance of the corner can be as important as thinking about complete streets and multimodal streets and so on, because the corner is the convergence place and um, a whole lot of history exists about why jewelry stores locate on corners and so on and so forth. Shareable places, the laundromat, um, cafe in Copenhagen and Reykjavik, hang out and drink and do your laundry while you're at it. This is our sustainable future. We have an ice cream on the map in our neighborhood in Madrona, um, in Seattle. Places at night, this is actually in Melbourne, not in Italy. This is Ligon Street. Um, has a lot to do in our um, neck of the woods with rather restrictive um, ways in which rights of way can be used that have fouled us up a bit. We are getting better at it, but for those of you who've been here, blocks and blocks and blocks, and you have to wade through the restaurants as you walk along. Fundamental memories of the way things used to be. You go to a developing country, you see remarkable things done with wheeled vehicles, which we've forgotten how to do, and you see housing types in Maasai villages, and this was a real one, not a tourist Maasai village, standing the test of time. Examples from history of cities that, towns that were more sustainable than Copenhagen today in some ways, based on closed loop systems. Um, that we don't have time to go into today, but it's in the book. This is in Matera in southern Italy, now being repopulated, actually, as you can see. Same deal in Split in Croatia. Emperor Diocletian's palace became a town, still very much recognizable within the central district today, and that's a sketch my dad did, actually, showing the historic Roman military streets. Ephemeral qualities like light. And here's more of Lisbon and just a sort of a magical things that happen that we don't always have control over. So to conclude, where, what do we do with all this? You know, I've thrown out a lot of universals. And I, uh, in the book, which is not entirely a complete book, I'm working on getting another one. Uh, I'm almost up to contract, I think, with Island Press. But this was the introductory ideas on this, this way of thinking. But I think... I, I outline a five-part process that really seems to be what you're doing here, Brad. You know, you're going and you're looking at these things and you're figuring out what works here, what might work here, and why. How do we gain the inputs through a process like Future Frio to ground truth, some of perceptions versus realities, and so on and so forth. Can a given idea that you see elsewhere um, uh, effectively transmit to a local context? And this is not a perfect process, as I've set it out, but intended to be inspirational. For instance, this Ferris, every, everybody's got to have a Ferris wheel, right? The point here in, um, in Seattle, this, this Ferris wheel, entirely a private business's attempt to 
preserve customer flow while a lot of work goes on on our reinvented waterfront. At the same time that the same great landscape architect, James Corner, is working on a great waterfront plan around it. All of a sudden, this has become a centerpiece of Seattle's waterfront plan. It wasn't there before. It's nothing that the city came up with, but it's part of the iconic imagery right now. Um, how, where do we go from here? I've talked about the virtues of urban diaries done by everyone. Context matters. I think we've said that enough. Um, longevity versus pop-up. There are folks out there, as you all know, I know you're experimenting a lot with pop-up here is people who are just about pop-up and tactical urbanism and so on and so forth. That's great, but what comes after? And the idea of <coughs> organic versus designed, how does the design uh, receive the organic and how it relates to planning and regulatory practice. Now, um, human fundamentals and this notion that places survive differently hand-me-down, multi-scale, and the shared economy that I've referred to before. Um, a quick conclusion on some things I've been thinking about since then to pick up on these themes. In France, an abandoned town in the middle of a military reservation. Shocking. <laughs> Just we came, My brother and I came upon it. I was about to go speak to folks in New Hampshire in the United States about this type of stuff. And I went to New Hampshire and I said, look, you guys have the idea of a New England, you don't need me. You have the idea of a compact New England town to receive, and so your towns can survive through a concept, an idea. Here we have all the physical trappings of a town with an anthro D sign because it's now run by the military as a practice uh, facility, if you will. So places survive differently. Urban history, I alluded to Edinburgh earlier. It's another piece that I wrote. Going to Edinburgh, you see all the basis for the public health failures of alleys and laneways and density and kind of like Venice, um, tall buildings and uh, dating from a whole historic infrastructure and social structure that really doesn't matter anymore because the Scots and the Brits aren't at war. But I already alluded to the collective memory of these things as bad, unsafe things doing density right. We already learned how to do it. We have ample examples from human history about why it didn't work before. Now we have the tools to do it correctly. The 400 meter rule, I worked with folks from Scotland. The idea is, very simply, absent the automobile, we have a latent human comfort with a downtown space and a main street that's about 400 meters or 437 yards long. Maybe that's something we can design with, because that's one of these latencies. And then finally, in the spirit of football, not your football, when our Seattle Seahawks won the Super Bowl, our world championship of football, um, a couple of years ago, we had an amazing parade where 700,000 people came downtown. <coughs> Seattle's city, you know, Seattle itself, 635,000 people. There are more people in town than the whole population of the city, downtown. Nothing went wrong. And spaces were reused remarkably, and there were um, 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 incredible um, lessons. I actually went backwards that time, and I went to, meant to go forwards. Incredible lessons learned about how even an unplanned celebratory event can teach you about good urbanism. So when the Dockers do their thing, Purple Haze, Jimi Hendrix, Seattle. You got it from us. Um, when the Dockers do their thing, think about the parade and all the festivities and how to, how to keep things under control. This is just a survey, I hope, inspirational. I think I went a few minutes over, and I apologize for that. If you want to read the book, it's easily accessible online. And I, again, I thank you so much for the opportunity. been incredibly patient so thank you very much. Brad, Matthew, can you please uh, join Chuck up at the front there? And
have I got some questions from the floor about all that we've heard. I know we've taken you on an amazing journey of facts and figures and great places, great spaces. This is a Fremantle audience, come on. <laughs> I just wonder about the role of urbanism, um, the redevelopment of cities, and if it relies, in your instance, primarily on gentrification. Well, that's the question of the day, and I don't know that I. Um, is this help? Yes, it does. Uh, it's the question of the day around the world, and I don't know that I have a great answer. We, I know, are struggling with it horribly. We, we have, right now in Seattle, there's an incredible amount of effort going into retaining um, affordable housing stock and developing new affordable units. We don't have um, social housing as you do. I mean, we do, but it's it's it, 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 you know it's mostly market stuff. And um, I fear that um, anytime you find a successful place, you're going to find with it elevating. Um, 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 housing costs and so on and so forth. We were um, we were just in London, and um, a hilarious Uber driver told us the story of East London, and this was a guy who'd grown up there, and um, it's the same story. I think I think the answer is to be simultaneously aware of um, the unintended consequences, and if the uh, social justice programming and housing programming can keep up with the anticipated uh, successes. Um, that's key, and that may take government subsidy. It may take, in our world, um, extracting agreement from private developers to do certain things that they wouldn't naturally do. And that's what's going on in Seattle right now, and I was involved in negotiating some of that. Um, um, there are steps, but we fear in our country, we have the example, the lead example, is always we don't want to become San Francisco. So you raise, all I can say is you raise the, 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 the world issue right now, and you know it, and um, it's just incredibly important to keep a simultaneous eye on a number of factors and not just get caught up in the eye candy. Uh, so. Do you want to respond as well? Okay. It's funny because I was actually going to ask the same question, and because um, it is, I mean, it's one of the ones that I've just, I think we did, we, and we council, because we've so long been trying to make free work, and that sense of, you know, how do we turn free around, and I guess there's been a little bit of a sense lately, which is really nice, that that's happening, and then I think a new issue has emerged around how do we keep free now interesting, I um, mean, and, and, and thinking about all the, re, a lot of the interesting things that have happened over the last few years, I mean, take that many six months ago as an example. I mean, how do you keep that kind of stuff going um, when all of a sudden there are no cheap spaces? Actually? So it's actually it's the cheap spaces and, and the innovation that's come out of those that have, I think, actually been great for Fremantle in terms of bringing creative, bespoke, authentic things happening. And and the danger for us is that as we, we, we try to drive investment, drive, and that's working, but now we're going to have a whole new challenge. Right, and I know time is short. I, I, I did not even talk about, in longer versions of this talk, I talked about the role of tourism and um, the, the heritage versus touristic uh, pressures and how we've seen in Europe and elsewhere. Towns, you know, historic towns become essentially shells with chain, uh, chain commercial businesses therein. And, and um, there, there's just these trends to watch for. And, um, you know, I think if you get by what you're trying to do to avoid it. And I think one of the examples of Amsterdam is that they have attracted um, bus tourists, so big coaches arrive every day, and these people are aged and often with mobility issues, and they don't get out of the coach, so they just snap, 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 snap all the way through Amsterdam. So Amsterdam locals put up with the pressure of the extra traffic and their streets being congested, but not much money gets spent there. Yeah, so that's the trap, isn't it? You're, who are you trying to attract? There's a gentleman up there, blue shirt. We know a lot about urbanism. We can see that uh, Fremantle is a really interesting place to live. But we're also surrounded by what, about 1.3 million people. What is it that will change people's minds in a city like Perth to move into this sort of environment? 
Well, I'm happy to go just by, by perhaps reflecting a little bit on um, some work that we're doing for the, for the reports um, with, um, uh, with the community of Perth. One of the things that was really very interesting that we, um, we sort of stumbled across was to think more deeply about Fremantle's change in regional role. So if you go back to the, you know, I think both um, Chuck and Brad reflected nicely on the role of history. And uh, it struck us that Fremantle's regional role has significantly diminished since at least the turn of the century. So there's increasing competition from suburban centres, from new urban centres that uh, emerged from the 1970s and so on. But one of the people we spoke to noted that as they tried to get to Fremantle from driving from the southwest, they couldn't get here. Every road took them back to the freeways. They came back from Bunbury and they tried to get into Fremantle. And it's almost like there's, a, there's Fremantle's been bypassed somehow and it's lost its, its, regional, its regional significance. So I think it's something about repositioning in Fremantle's regional significance within the metropolitan fabric. That seems to have somehow diminished and is not to really re-establish that somehow. I think that's a, that's a good point. I think it is right. I mean, I think, and you go back and, and it's covered strangely a, a, a street directory <coughs> from the 1960s in my, in yeah. my And it was amazing seeing that there was just a, the importance that Fremantle played. There wasn't much else. It was kind of like Fremantle, Claremont, Sudeco, Perth. And yeah, that real sense of that Fremantle was a very, was extremely significant. And I think our future, though, and I, what I hope our significance evolved into, and I think it's about Coming on from what Chuck was talking about, is you've got to you've got to take what your your passions and your strengths and your history is and evolve that. And I think we can do that. I think that's around that. that, that come back to some of the cultural elements, the things that you can't get anywhere else. I mean, and what I love about Fred is there is so much here that you just cannot create because it, and that's that's pretty amazing. So we've got to make sure we keep that and, and bring that to the fore, whilst you know enabling more people to live and work here at the same time. <coughs> Any other questions? Over here. I'm curious, based on your West Coast experience, because you, like we, live in an environment where we have an urban local government authority, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we have a state government, and then we have a federal government beyond that. Um, many of the issues that have been discussed are influenced by those levels of government that are beyond the people who we get a chance to vote for and elect. So is there any learning that we could take from what's happened on the West Coast as to how the community can mobilize in such a way that its desires can be reflected by the decisions of governments who need to worry about a whole bunch of other people other than just us? And I noticed, I just thought that the lead-in about the way in which all the roads go back on the freeway perhaps is a case in point. But, uh, the <coughs> council, I rest my case. <laughs> Where are you from? <laughs> Where's that accent? Um, so, I, I think there, as you point out, I mean, there are some rank similarities. And, um, the, the, the answer is sometimes in the, the, the various roles granted to different levels of government, which is, I think, I infer from your question. And we have county government, which takes care of some things, even for the incorporated cities. Um, but we have a wealth of municip special purpose municipalities with just about everything, like a stadium or a, or a transit authority or a park or so on and so forth. And I think one answer is, um, lesson learned from Washington State, United States, and Oregon, United States, is we have very advanced land use planning laws that have some element of, that we have in Washington what we call the Growth Management Act, and in Oregon, the Oregon Land Use Law. At the state level, there are 13, 15 land use goals that trickle down through a comprehensive planning system in which every government has a particular role. There's mandated verticality and horizontality, and it's not an entirely top-down system because it can inform back up as well. And so I think it, 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 it in the end, can, can take some real redesign of government form and function to, um, to redefine some of these issues. And it's something that we struggle with too, and um, a lot of, a lot of, a lot 
of, of, of the major infrastructure projects have to be approved by the voters for us too. Seattle is Lyle for anybody who heard Lyle's talk here in spring of 2014. Seattle voted down the equivalent of light rail four or five times over its history um, because it, it it always went to the voters. Um, so in the American democracy, I'm not sure that we have any magical answers. I can tell you, though, to your question, I think we do some things better in the northwest part of the country because of the um, advanced planning laws that we have. Federal government is generally not in the business of land use regulation. They are in the business of environmental protection. But um, that's probably the best answer I can give in this forum right now. We'd like to talk more about it. I think one of the big things that I learned out of many of my study tours is the city government is obviously often at a scale that it can put money on the table to catalyse the infrastructure projects. So, you know, here light rail is a discussion with can we afford it in Fremantle ahead of any other jurisdiction? Because you wouldn't be able to put much money on the table. Yeah. Is there, is there not also a, a case though where we do we expect too much of government? So in the last ten minutes we've had a lot of government doing this, that and the other. And I wonder about the role of civil society, for example, volunteer organisations, non-government groups, uh, private ent uh, enterprise and so on, in stimulating really interesting urban spaces. And, and you know, we've reflected a bit on Peter Hall earlier. One of his great books, of course, was Great Planning Disasters. And of course, that book pointed to the role of a lot of really well-intentioned planners ending up doing some pretty dreadful things. So maybe we expect too much. Yeah, yeah, and I think that. Um in our neck of the woods, despite this crackerjack planning system I've just described, um, what we call um, the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, not unlike Committee for Perth, are doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Remember I alluded to the Downtown Seattle Association's um, uh, Metropolitan District, take, you know, essentially taking over a couple of the problematic downtown parks and providing um, management abilities that the public sector was no longer able to, to provide. So I think that's a very, very good point, Matt. John. Um, you know, Chuck, I was very uh, taken with your little uh, aside when you mentioned uh, pen pricks, um, little things with little budgets. And uh, I think Freeman actually does that quite well every now and again. You know, there was a sudden outburst of of uh, street art, I think, uh, that came through maybe the council support. Of that, but it, it actually changed the place. Lots of few little things that happened. But maybe you can give us a couple of other examples, which I just really like that idea of little tiny things that some of them just will die on the vine straight away, and others will sort of go uh, take off and, and change the place. Well, I think we, we my point is always that we try too hard to come up with these silver bullets when there's naturally occurring things that can um, solve the problem simply in, in the way you describe it. Um, I think the shared, I think the shared business model is um, a very cool example. The, the ice cream laundromat, for instance, our neighborhood has changed considerably because of that little ice cream window. I, I'm serious. Um, I think Fiona would agree. Um, that lines every summer night in a, uh, in a space that there really needs to be as much activity. And there's on that street, which is a, let's just call it, it's not an, an arterial, but it's a neighborhood main street. There's several restaurants, there's some small businesses and offices, but that ice cream business, um, which is essentially a window in a laundromat space, has done an enormous amount. And then, around the corner, the positioning of a bench. You know, and really, this is why I get a little cynical about the parklet idea. We've got to come in and have this great, we're going to close the intersection and we're going to throw people in the pit. Because I, I'm, I think, more in favor of these simple fixes. Um, so there's that. I think that. Um, I'm trying to think of another one that um, uh, that has brought you know this very simple uh, invigoration without a whole lot of activity. I think I think really um, the uh, there's there's something that's very interesting. Um, do you know what a sandwich board sign is? Like okay, 
Those technically were not permitted in Seattle, but um, businesses started putting them out and violating all the rules and um, you know, causing situations where people could trip on them and so on and so forth. But it showed people where businesses were. And it also helped the feeling of, 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 of street life. Um, I know finally in one town north of Seattle, I gave a similar talk once, I talked about Al Alley Movie Night, and a gentleman such as yourself got up because it was during a period in which this town was um, doing a vision in, in preparation for its revision to its comprehensive plan. And he said, you know the ice cream social that has occurred in the such and such neighborhood for 40 years? We've got to put that in our, we've got to encourage that in our comprehensive plan. Um, and so I, I think it's maybe just thinking about some of the, the social traditions that sometimes are, are, are it, it cultural in nature and, um, and you might not even think about. Um, capture them before they die and, you know, you can, achieve some amazing results. And my question is for you, Matthew. Um, it's, I'm hoping you're kind of going to speak a bit more on regional significance, um, particularly in the way of uh, Fremantle and certainly Perth as a whole. I know you've done some research in terms of energy um, and looking at how Perth is, is interconnected with the rest of the world with, in terms of being an energy hub. And you've just shown that your research there on Fremantle is that we're really interconnected as well. Um, however, how do we go about promoting um, promoting business um, in Fremantle? But I know that also that Grattan Institute have done some research on, well, really governments can't do a whole lot in trying to encourage these centres. They can do, they can assist with research and development and providing um, providing the workforce, but they can't actually provide these startups or these clusters. Um, so what can What's being done in your research, or what do you know of that Fremantle could do, or what are we doing in Fremantle, Brad, that's promoting this? Well, uh, I mean, to contradict myself a moment ago, I, mean, I think the government is an enabler in that regard. I think in terms of you know, uh, uh, sensible land use planning and regulations and investment attraction and so on. But I think the other thing is, is while I focused a little bit on the port in that discussion, one of the things that we focused a little bit more on in some of the background work for this was <laughs> Is there any sense that Fremantle might also play quite a significant role as a, as a small and emerging knowledge economy? And I mean, we're sitting in, in it right now, I think, in many respects. And Notre Dame, <laughs> I think, is a, is a little bit short of the crown as far as uh, Fremantle goes. And, and it's still, you know, it's very young in its history, this institution. But when you think about what universities are able to do, is that when they begin to, part, to partner with the private sector, with the government sector, and so on, they begin to generate all sorts of new knowledge. And I would, put, I would probably put money on the fact that. There are all sorts of interesting global visitors that come <coughs> through this university. There are people off on sabbatical leaves doing interesting collaborative research, and students are coming from abroad to study here. So, connectivity, I think, is not just about business linkages. It can be about all sorts of much more subtle forms of forms of connection that also position economies. But I think when you think about something like the university, what it also does it brings a young population into town. It creates a vibrant kind of Aspects. And also, perhaps the university has played a role in preserving some of that, that built environment that would possibly be lost or degraded had there not been a significant investor coming in. Now, there's probably lots of different points of views and counterpoints of views uh, to that, but I think connectivity would need to is much more than just trade relationships. They're about all sorts of other things, and they position places as well on the global economy. Mm. Just to drop my Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting one. I've just made me think about. I've been reading two, two books. One did this week, and one was um, Evidence Without Effort. I also read Marcus Westbury's new book around creating cities. Um, and he, your question made me think about what well, he talks about there is around um, the new emerging economy that is actually linked to makers and the fact that we're all connected actually much more than we've ever been. And the great advantage of that is it can actually bring bespoke manufacturing and all those things that can back into our cities, in especially where there are affordable places for people to work and, you know, and taking the Etsy or whatever the other kind of online sites are that actually do that. And the way that's actually starting to transform how we understand cities and how they work and how they're connected to other places when historically mm -hmm. you've been you know, making something from a self skill approach for a better example. You might have a local market of five people, but now we have a global market of 500,000 people. And that's actually 
actually re <coughs> change the way we think about manufacturing, which I think is potentially really exciting as long as we make sure we do those connections. And one of the things that's come up in the research already is the role of the port uh, in that as well. The sorts of people that are working in the port or connecting with the port, and the fact that you actually got a very high level of uh, graduate. In your, so you've got this really sort of great knowledge economy that also plays to your sort of creative, you know, something to be exploited. All right, we promised we would have you out of here by six o'clock, so I'm going to start with the thank yous. Firstly, thank you to my staff, Holly and Georgie, for organising this with the team at Notre Dame. Uh, thank you to the members of the steering committee who are here, so Alison Coates, uh, Kieran Wong, Tony Monaghan, Gary Clark. Ross Stewart, I forgot Graham McKenzie. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, um, this has been a good refresher for them of what we've sort of covered over the last couple of months in our journey. What happens now is an intensive writing and evaluation period, uh, all working towards the 1st of December lunch, which the Chamber is organising for us. Uh, in terms of our speakers tonight, I think you'll agree that uh, we've certainly covered a lot of ground. Uh, it's great to have an international perspective. So starting with Chuck first, thank you so much and Fiona, thank you so much for giving up part of your holiday. You probably came back from Broome earlier than you would have liked to, to uh, accommodate us. So thank you very much. And um, as a virtual thank you to Lyle for introducing us in the first place. I'm, I'm sure you'll be watching our work with interest. Uh, Matthew Chance is one of the smartest guys I know and I've got to work with him over, over a decade now and um, I can so rely on him and today he had to tell me that he wanted to rejig our schedule a little bit and I don't care how we rejig the schedule as long as we're launching on the 1st of December because that's the no, no negotiation. <laughs> uh, and Brad has been, I think, an inspiration for you all. Committee for Perth has carved out a significant piece of research to do for you on your behalf and Brad has been completely relaxed throughout the process. So thank you for having faith that we can deliver something that I think will be incredibly useful to you in your future deliberations. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you had to sort of sit there uh, for quite a long time. Come outside, have some, some refreshments and catch up with our speakers and we look forward to talking to you on the 1st of December with a very comprehensive report. Thanks very much.